Our monitors now take us live to the White House where we just heard from White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre reiterating support for communities affected by Hurricane Helene and Milton. She also echoed, echoed calls for Congress to fund the disaster loan program and many other topics. CBS News Chief Correspondent for the White House, Nancy Cordes, was in that briefing room. You stepped out on the White House lawn to talk to us. We heard you get a couple of questions in, but let's start with that question you asked about the letter sent by the United States to Israel regarding getting more humanitarian aid into Gaza, potentially causing our ability to, and, and willingness to send more uh, military aid to Israel on the line there. What did they have to say? Right, so I asked uh, Corinne Jean-Pierre Reed about this a pretty pointed letter that was sent by the Secretaries of Defense and State to the Israeli government, basically telling them, hey, if you don't start allowing more humanitarian aid to flow into Gaza, then the U.S. is going to have to reevaluate the uh, massive amounts of aid that we send to you every month. And they gave Israel about a month until right after Election Day to, uh, to show significant progress. And so I asked Marie Jean-Pierre uh, about the timing of the letter, about whether they had gotten any response from the Israelis. She really wouldn't get into that. Uh, but she did argue uh, that they have sent a letter like this once before back in April. They felt that they got some results then. Uh, they have seen a reduction in humanitarian aid being allowed to get into Gaza again, and so that's why they felt that they needed to send this letter now. So we'll see if the Israelis take any concrete steps to react and how concerned they are that U.S. military aid really could be on the line here. All right, so a lot on the line with elections just, what, 29 days away. President Joe Biden yesterday in the state of Philadelphia. We understand he's going to be out on the campaign trail helping to make those closing arguments more and more in the coming days, specific to Pennsylvania. Why is his presence so crucial? Well, in Pennsylvania, it's crucial because Pennsylvania considers him something of a native son. He always talks about the fact that he grew up in Scranton before he ended up moving to Delaware, which he represented in the Senate for so many decades. And so uh, he, he does have favored son status in Pennsylvania. That's why you'll see him go back there again and again. And more broadly, uh, throughout the country, in battleground states, he can sometimes say things even more sharply than Kamala Harris herself might. Uh, for example, yesterday at a campaign event, he called Trump a loser. He brought up the fact that Trump mm. uh, was swaying to music for about half an hour on the stage the other night with a crowd. Uh, he said, what's wrong with this guy? Uh, so, you know, he's got this plain spoken style that the campaign hopes will be an asset. And really, his own legacy is on the line here, because if Donald Trump is elected, he'll probably try to roll back a lot of things that Joe Biden did. And so he's got a lot of self-interest here in trying to get Kamala Harris across the finish line. One of the last chapters, speaking of his legacy and his presidency, will be aid to the people who are so ravaged by the hurricanes, Helene and Milton. He talked about an aid package. What can you tell us more about that? Right. He said that uh, billions more will be going to Florida, uh, will be going to uh, the multiple states that were impacted by Hurricane Helene, trying to send a message to disaster victims there that the U.S. government is not going to forget about them, that despite the fact that Congress isn't rushing back, Reed, to pass some kind of major mm -hmm. Uh, disaster relief package that uh, the U.S. is still on their side and that that aid is coming one way or another, even if Congress doesn't actually end up voting on it until after Election Day. Nancy Cordes from the White House lawn, fresh from the update from Corinne Jean-Pierre there in the White House briefing room. As always, an honor to have you on the stream. Thank you so much. Let's jump the map now to Georgia, where presidential candidates wanting the White House also want that state's very crucial 16 electoral votes. So, Here's the latest at this hour from elections officials. Early voting started yesterday. State officials report record turnout. So this was after a judge handed down two monumental rulings. Let's talk about those. First, blocking a rule requiring clerks to hand count ballots on election night, which could have delayed results for quite a while. And then speaking to that, the second, a mandated order, really, that county election officials certify those results by November 12th. CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian reports from Marietta, Georgia. 
Just as early voting gets underway here in Georgia, there were two significant rulings by a local judge, Robert McBurney. Late last night, he blocked a controversial new rule that was just passed by the state election board that would have required ballots to be hand counted on election night. He said that it was too late and too much to implement at this point. He also cited January 6th, saying the memories of that day haven't faded away and any additional uncertainty surrounding the election could be a disservice to the public. His ruling was applauded by Democrats, including the Harris campaign, which said that this makes our democracy stronger. Meantime, McBurney also issued another ruling that, in essence, requires a local officials to certify their election results on time. These were all challenges stemming from a series of recent rules that were passed by a right-leaning election board here in the state. There are several other challenges pending, including a court hearing that will take place later this afternoon. Nicole, thank you for that. Looking live at the State Department, where for a second day in a row, spokesman Matt Miller will step to that microphone right there behind me on major international issues. So top of mind today, U.S. military aid to the Middle East and getting that humanitarian assistance across the border into Gaza. When Mr. Miller takes to the mic, we will bring it to you. The first time we see him on CBS News 24-7. Meantime, let's talk about this. An emergency session of the U.N. Security Council on claims that Israel does not allow humanitarian aid to enter Gaza. Israeli ambassador to the U.N. Danny Dannon spoke to reporters before that session debunking those claims. We hear a lot of accusations about humanitarian effort in Gaza. So I want to make it clear. Over one million tons of aid have been delivered via more than 50,000 trucks, including over 700,000 tons of food. The problem in Gaza is not lack of aid. The problem is Hamas, which hijacks the aid, stealing, storing, and selling it to feed their terror machine while civilians suffer. Despite all these challenges, Israel continues to uphold international law going above and beyond our obligations. I'll give you a few examples. We recently coordinated the transfer of patients from a hospital in Jebalia to another location in Gaza. We delivered 70,000 liters of fuel to maintain medical services, and uh, we continue with the polio vaccination uh, efforts. While we are determined to destroy Hamas, who committed the horrific massacre of October 7th, and to bring back all of our hostages, Israel remains committed to working with our international partners to ensure aid reaches those in need. So that is your headline from Israel saying the problem is with Hamas hijacking the aid. Uh, also speaking to communication between the United States and Israel, the U.S. saying Israel is not doing enough to prevent more casualties there on the ground. CBS News foreign correspondent Rami Innocencio has this report from Tel Aviv. Hi there, and that private letter from Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Secretary of State Antony Blinken has now become very public, and it's accusing Israel of slowing or stopping almost 90% of all the aid across Gaza last month. They also demand that Israel let in at least 350 aid trucks into Gaza every single day through new pauses in fighting. And we did see some change after that warning. The IDF said that aid from 50 trucks with food and medical supplies coming from Jordan were transferred into the northern Gaza. Gaza Strip. Separately, the State Department condemned an Israeli airstrike on Sunday that killed at least four people, burning at least one of them alive. This was outside a hospital in central Gaza. The IDF says that it targeted Hamas terrorists, but one of them was a mother along with her 19-year-old son. A state called their deaths horrifying. And on Israel's northern front in Lebanon, a new IDF airstrike rocked Beirut. The military says that two Air Force fighter jets struck an underground Hezbollah weapon stockpile. That happened just a few hours, though, after the U.S. said that it opposed more strikes on Lebanon's capital because of the rising civilian death toll. Lebanon's health ministry says now more than 2,300 people have been killed in the country in the past year. And on top of all this, we wait for Israel's counterstrike against Iran in response to Iran's attack on October 1st. And it's believed that that could come at any time. Innocencio reporting there. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says he has a plan for victory in Ukraine's war with Russia. 
So he laid that out, telling members of Ukraine's parliament it is called the Victory Plan. It, however, hinges on one key component. Western allies must invite Ukraine to join NATO. Ukraine hopes for an invitation to join NATO before President Biden leaves office. So the clock is ticking there. No word yet from any Western partners on whether they will endorse the plan to embrace Ukraine into NATO. Jumping the mat now for a victory lap in the state of Florida by Governor Ron DeSantis. He's saying electricity has never been restored so quickly to so many after a major storm. The governor cites success while also mindful that tens of thousands still wait for the lights to come back on. Meanwhile, there's another problem on the ground. The floodwaters continue to swell. And knowing that, we can also tell you in total, 268 people died from Milton and Helene. And in North Carolina, families continue to search for loved ones, 92 people still missing. Uh, Governor Roy Cooper said FEMA paid out $99 million in relief across that state, but washed out roads and bridges still slow the cleanup efforts. And by the way, school closures, they are still happening. That's heightening a lot of concern from parents. So far, everybody's in shock mode, right? And assessment mode, still no timeline for repairs. But parents worry that students won't be able to make up for lost time as they go past the new year and approach the graduation season. So our thoughts with so many there. Jess, what kind of weather are they going to have there as the searchers are out looking for the 92 people? Yeah, you know, we're starting to see calmer conditions throughout all the tropics. Thanks okay. to that major cold front that swept throughout the East Coast. If you live in the East Coast, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Today, we're about 10 to 20 degrees below average yeah. as that huge air mass sweeps to the south, kind of suppressing tropical activity for the time being. So let's dive into that forecast real fast. Heading over into the tropics where conditions are going to continue to stay relatively calm as we wrap up this week. Taking a look at our globe right now, well, we can notice that cold front and just those bands of clouds and showers sweeping to the south but for the rest of the tropics i mean it is pretty calm there's two systems that we're keeping a close eye on right now one over closer to mexico the second one well off into the east and as i mentioned that system that continues to sweep to the south that huge dense air mass it's going to allow for calmer conditions near Florida as we head into the remainder of this week. Now, here's what the National Hurricane Center has to say about this, though. About a 10% chance as of now for this first system to form within the next two days. And when and if that is the case, it's mostly going to move off into the east, not posing a threat for our friends up in Florida or anywhere throughout the states for that matter. We head over into the east, though, a similar trend, just a little bit more activity with the second system. That the National Hurricane is also tracking with about a 30% chance of formation within the next 48 hours. That's expected to turn into a tropical depression by the time it makes its way off into the west, bringing in thunderstorm activity and light showers to heavy showers anywhere from the Dominican Republic all the way over into Cuba, too. So we'll continue to keep a close eye on that. But that huge air mass that moves in from the northeast, that's what's bringing in snow and ice pellets widespread throughout those northeast states and also those cool, chilly temperatures that I was mentioning too, Reed. Okay, things to watch out for, Jess. Thank you so much. We'll be back in just a minute. More focus on Hurricane Milton and the recovery efforts there. Neighbors helping neighbors and plans working in some places and in other places. So many people still frustrated. Let's go back to Florida now where the road to recovery after Hurricane Milton looks a little less bumpy for those who had hurricane resilient homes. CBS News national correspondent Dave Malkoff shows us how one neighborhood held up on the west coast of Florida. This is Cortez, Florida, right off of Longboat Key on the western side of the state. And you can see a lot of these homes still don't have any roofs. The cleanup has just begun in some cases or hasn't even yet begun a week after this powerful storm came through. There's lots of debris on the side of the road, but there are still north of 60,000 customers. That is homes and businesses that don't have power as of this morning. So a lot of people are just starting to get their power back on. Most of the state, the people who have lost their power, they have their power back on. But if that's you, who didn't have your power restored and the storm has been a week ago, that is going to be a devastating time for you. There are two different kinds of homes here in Florida, and we are exploring that tonight on the CBS Evening News. There are the homes like these that are right on the coast that were kind of obliterated, 
and uh, some of these are still standing, but some homes that we have seen are just a foundation and the rest of the home has been pushed miles away, just debris everywhere. But just across the street from here, there is a new type of development, a development that's not only structurally hurricane resilient, but they actually produce their own power. They're called a virtual power plant. All the homes have, have solar panels on their roofs and they feed into a grid system that has batteries all around. So even if the power goes off on these power lines, like it has for tens of thousands of people still in Florida, they can still have their lights on. But should they rebuild? on those portions of Florida that are right on the coast. We will talk to members of the community who lost their homes and are now just starting to rebuild along with the people who wrote it out in a hurricane resilient building. I'm Dave Malkoff, CBS News, back to you. Dave, thank you. Our video monitors take us to Kentucky where frosty temperatures formed ice pellets. Jess talked about this a moment ago. Look at that, they fell from the sky. This view is from Richmond, just south of Lexington. It wasn't just Kentucky folks. We saw the same thing playing out in Ohio in several places. That's when my grandma would stick her head out the door, Jess, and say, oh, my hail. <laughs> That's a good one. All right. Well, yeah, from the Ohio Valley stretching all the way up into the northeast, over 90 million people woke up to this morning to freezing conditions. Actually, we had frost advisories, freeze advisories, all widespread throughout those states. And we continue to keep a close eye on what the National Weather Service has to say about that, too. Those advisories still in effect in the highlighted blue color, anywhere from Arkansas stretching up into Buffalo, New York, too. So let me drop that real fast. And I want to talk about these temperatures. It's interesting because we head over into states like Texas, where just yesterday and the day before we were talking about record breaking numbers for daytime highs, we got up to the 90s. Now we're down into the 60s as that same cold front, that huge air mass of cold, dense air sits over the plains and all the way up into the northeast, delivering more 50s and 60s in the forecast for us this afternoon along the east coast. And now that similar trend is making its way over into states like Oklahoma and once again, Texas, too. So let's take a look behind me real fast. As that system sits directly over those states, we're going to continue to feel more cool almost winter like weather. I mean about 10 to 20 degrees below average for us as we head into this afternoon. High pressures driving that cold dense air for those communities and we see about 10 degrees below average in states like New York stretching all the way over into Pennsylvania as we make our way down into the south. Now I really want to highlight Texas because what a whiplash that is for those community members. It was Waco, Texas, Austin, Texas, San Antonio too. Just yesterday we were in the 90s. Now we're talking about 60s. It's going to stick around as we head into the afternoon hours today. Reed. Mother Nature just keeps us guessing. Oh, I really love it. <laughs> That's putting it nicely. Yes. Hey, we have an opportunity right now to ride our video monitors for a live picture into a chapter in American history, a memorial service for the matriarch of the Kennedy dynasty, Ethel Kennedy, playing out in Washington, D.C. right now. You can see three former presidents standing there. On the left, President Joe Biden speaking to former President Barack Obama and then standing next to former President Bill Clinton, also Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi there standing. Uh, this is playing out today, and President Biden is expected to deliver that eulogy there in Washington, D.C. Quite a chapter closing in the Kennedy family. This is all happening while these leaders are also making the closing arguments. 29 days until Election Day, President Joe Biden will leave this memorial service, as will former President Barack Obama, to make the case for Kamala. When we come back, we will ride our video monitors all the way to the West Coast, the state of California, and a white hot case, the Menendez brothers case, now dominating headlines. We have why and who is stepping forward saying, let them out from behind bars. Moving on the map to the state of California and a white hot murder case back in the spotlight after years and years. Family members of Eric and Lyle Menendez will hold a news conference today as prosecutors review new evidence that could change the fate of these brothers convicted of murdering their parents. CBS News correspondent Jonathan Vigliotti joins us now live from Los Angeles. Jonathan, I'm fascinated after watching the documentary, after watching the Netflix series, but what's happening in real life that's actually bringing up reviews and people advocating for that review? Mm. 
Yeah, Enrique, good morning to you. You know, both of those productions really matter in the court of public opinion, outlying really a case of repeated sexual assault in the hands of Jose Menendez against his sons, Eric and Lyle. But from a legal standpoint, this case really began to reignite more than a year ago with another documentary on the band Menudo. Jose Menendez at the time was a high-ranking executive at a music company. And you had Roy Rosseo, who was a member of the band, who in that documentary claimed that he was sexually abused by Jose. That evidence was used by the Menendez brothers last year to file a habeas corpus petition asking for resentencing. And, and now you have the DA here in LA just last month announcing that he's gonna to start to review that evidence. Included in part of that evidence is a letter that was allegedly written by Eric to his cousin. This was in 1998, so a year before the murders, where he talks about being afraid of his father, alludes to sexual abuse. So that will also be taken into consideration. To give you some context here, the first trial was in 1993, where defense argued self-defense, but then you had the prosecution arguing that the motive was money. Ultimately, that ended with a hung jury. So you jump ahead to 1996, three years later, the judge limiting the testimony of sexual abuse. We know what happened. They were charged, found guilty of first degree murder, sentenced to life in prison without parole. But now all these years later, you have critics that are really putting pressure saying that the judge, the court, and even the media back then did not seriously consider sexual abuse specifically as it pertained to young men. That all sets the scene for what you see here in downtown LA, outside the courthouse. You have family members that are gonna gather here later, all in an effort to put pressure on the district attorney raid. Yeah, Jonathan, when you contrast that first trial that ended with a deadlocked jury and the fact that family members actually went on the stand and said that they had some knowledge of abuse, to the mm -hmm. second trial where none of that was allowed in, it really makes us tune in to that family that is getting ready to talk. What do we expect them to say today? Yeah, you can imagine, Reed, you have a lot of people that are outraged. You know, very early on in the 90s, you had a divided family, those that believed the brothers and those that did not. But now you really have a united front. We're talking as many as two dozen family members will be gathered here later. They will also be joined by Rosie O'Donnell, who has been very vocal and advocating on behalf of the brothers. We expect some of the family to really support and corroborate what the Menendez brothers have been saying again. This is all an effort to put pressure on the DA, and it appears to be working because the district attorney just on Sunday posted a photo of that letter that we've been talking about on Instagram. It has since been removed, but clearly top of mind for the district attorney, Reid. CBS News correspondent Jonathan Vigliotti in Los Angeles. Thank you so much. Always great talking to you. you. Appreciate it so much. Thanks, Our video monitors now take us to Barrow County, Georgia. That is where the father of the accused shooter in the Appalachian High School mass shooting faced a judge today. Colin Gray faces multiple charges because prosecutors believe he bought the gun used in the mass shooting for his son, 14-year-old Colt Gray. Colt stands accused of killing two teachers and two students in last month's attack. Senior coordinating producer for CBS News Crime and Public Safety Unit, Anna Schechter, joins us live on the stream. Anna, what happened in court today? Well, it was very revealing. We learned more about what happened in the minutes and months leading up to the shooting uh, than we had known before. And really what prosecutors were doing is trying to make a case that Colin, the father, is culpable. He faces um, secondary manslaughter charges. He also uh, faces charges related to child abuse. And what detectives said on the stand is that for months leading up to the shooting, he was purchasing guns and ammunition and other uh, materials that could be used in a shooting. And also that uh, the son, Colt, 14-year-old Colt, had writings and drawings planning out a school shooting. And we've got some sound. Uh, let's take a listen to that sound uh, pertaining to that notebook that was found by investigators. We also located during the execution of the search warrant um, a notebook um, in Colt's bedroom. It had pretty detailed drawings of um, a stick figure that he had labeled you, so him. Um, it then says, shoot the teacher first. There's another stick figure um, with a bullet um, going through their body. It says gut shot. There's then pictures of two stick figures, students. That's, it then says the students next with an exclamation point next to their desks. So you hear 
um, you hear a re reading of these words that was an actual plan to carry out, to shoot a teacher first, then a student, a gut shot. I mean, he had been really thinking about this. Uh, we know from previous reporting that he had been fascinated by other school shootings, but this level of detail, uh, we weren't expecting to get all of that today. And a judge agreed with prosecutors that there was probable cause against the father and that the case against him can go forward. Uh, before I, my director's asked saying something really quickly say it again all right so just to go back to where i was we remember that body camera video where police visited the home of colt and his father there and they asked them about some suspicions that they had and the father said at the time that his son would catch hell if he ever thought anything do we know if the dad saw that notebook prior to the purchase of the gun we didn't get into that uh, in the hearing today, but we do know that the father was told that his son had posted to Discord an alarming message of threat to shoot up a middle, middle school uh, imminently, uh, and that he had even posted photos of guns, which authorities see that as a major red flag. And right. so um, local and federal um, officials have said so many red flags missed and today we heard all of the details about exactly what his father did to almost facilitate this and he did nothing to thwart it even when uh, Colt's mother became increasingly alarmed by his behavior and about his access to firearms and prosecutors said that she implored the father to keep those guns away from Colt and clearly he did not. And it's been reported that the mother actually called the morning when she heard about the shooting to police. Thank you so much for that update. We appreciate you being on the stream with us. Thanks Let's for move on me. the map now to the state of Nevada and some breaking news in the case of a former Las Vegas politician convicted in the murder of a reporter. Here's your headline in this case. Robert Tellis sentenced to 28 years behind bars for the stabbing death of Jeff German, a longtime reporter for the Las Vegas Review. Tellis' attorney indicated that his client intends to appeal that conviction. All right, jumping over to San Francisco and day three of the trial of the man accused of fatally stabbing Cash App founder Bob Lee. His name is Nima Momeni. He's the one accused. Jurors shown the knife used to stab Lee three times, once fatally in the heart. Momeni's defense team argues their client acted in self-defense. Let's move on the map now to the state of New York where the man facing murder charges and the deaths of six women will get a pretrial hearing before a New York Supreme Court justice. Rex Howerman faces those charges after those bodies were found alongside Gilgo Beach on Long Island over a time period spanning three decades. All right, so we understand also at the last hearing on July 30th, prosecutors presented extensive evidence against him, including DNA records and data from electronic devices. So far, no date set for that trial. Our monitors now take us to the State Department, where moments ago, spokesperson Matthew Miller was grilled by reporters on U.S. support for Israel. This is after that letter became public yesterday, the U.S. asking Israel to improve humanitarian aid in Gaza. Let's listen to what they had to say. Quick Q&A session from yesterday on the letter to the Israelis. Um, there seems to be some confusion about what the warning or what the message to Israel is. And a lot of people have taken the view or have interpreted it as you are threatening an, a quote unquote arms embargo on Israel. Now, maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, um, but my impression was that's not what is being um, threatened here or being discussed. So we, our commitment to Israel's security and to the defense of Israel is ironclad. That will not change. Um, as the letter makes clear, there are implications under U.S. law um, to, the, to the delivery of humanitarian assistance, and Israel doing everything that it can to ensure that de the delivery of humanitarian assistance is not impeded. And uh, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals, but it does make clear that there are implications under U.S. law. But our hope is that Israel will take the steps that we yeah, outlined. No, in I, I get that. And that's what you said yesterday. But the thing is, is that the letter talks about additional FMF, foreign military financing. Um, as you are well aware, there is a 10 year MOU with Israel that is already on the books that you are obligated to provide Israel with 3.3 billion a year uh, on, uh, in FMF on top, and then another 500 million 
a year until 2028 uh, for missile defense programs. When the letter talks about additional FFF, does it not mean on top of what you have already committed to? I don't want to get into parsing the letter in any further detail. As I said yesterday, we intended this to be a private diplomatic conversation, no, well, not, some, uh, not something that we discussed publicly. We're going to have the conversations about the full implications of the letter privately with the government of Israel, but I think I don't want to go beyond that publicly at this point. Yeah, but additional FMF, that does not include FMF that is already in the MOU that you have already committed to, and in which, in, in some cases, ha, the, ha, has already been spent, we, even post 2025 or 2026, whatever. We are going to follow our ob obligations under the law. And beyond that, I don't, as I said, I don't want to try to. Well, I'm not part sure I understand I, what your obligations are under the law, and it sounds like you you might not either. Uh, I do. I do fully understand. We're going to have okay. a good. So we're going to have additional FMF so mean money on the, top of the three point three billion a year. Uh, as I said, a year. this is not a letter that we intended to make public. We intended to discuss public. I understand it is public, and so it's very fair for you to ask questions about it. Um, but when it comes to those implications, we're going to have those conversations privately with the government of Israel. And we hope ultimately that this is all hypothetical because well, we hope I, ultimately the um, government of Israel implements the steps that we outlined. And there are no further implications. Right. But further implications, you can't even say, speak to what one implication. I can't speak be. to them here in this setting. And uh, okay. So if we drag you outside and <laughs> off, off camera, you'll be if able you, to speak if to you, the If you, uh, if you join the government of Israel, I'm happy to have a conversation with you about the, the intent of that letter. We'll no, be fully meet by it, but I don't think that's, uh, obviously that's not a step that's going to happen. No, that, I, I'm, 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 I'm being serious, Matt, here. The, no, the, I, I, we, I get we it, did, I'm being serious, too, because yeah. there are, there's, a, you know, there are people up on the hill who are outraged and, like, demanding that this be rescinded or demanding that you show proof of any potential violation of international humanitarian law or any hindrance of, of U.S. assistance getting in um, and, and calling this a threat of an arms embargo. And if that's not correct, they should be disabused of that notion because regardless of what you say about the timing of the letter, we're in the run-up to an election. So I think, you know, people should know what, you know, what it is that's at stake here. Is it additional, like on top of what's in already in the MO, the MOU, which runs until 2028, or does it include so, stuff that's in the MOU? So, first of all, people on the Hill say all kinds of things, um, not yes, all of which we, not all of which we but respond this has to. Become a political Look, I, I'm, thing. I, it has become a political thing, but that's always the case with this right. time. Doesn't matter. I'm not going to get it. What, what I will say is, look, we do have an obligation under the law to ensure that Israel has a qualitative military edge. We have an obligation under the law to um, uh, continue to comply with the obligations of the MOU. We also have an, uh, an obligation under the law to ensure that Israel complies with all elements okay. of U.S. law when it comes so to the use of our, of our not of security assistance you, that we provide. How you, you're saying then that you have not yet figured out how you might reconcile the two obligations, the qualitative military edge and the MOU, I, I'm saying we, with the um, we are, the additional FMF. We are not at a point today where we have to make that judgment, and we hope that we never get to that point. Right. Okay. Um, hold on. I just yeah. I want to go just to, to, to Lebanon for a second because there was this footage that uh, appeared, I guess, overnight, of Israel blowing up an entire village in, in, in southern Lebanon. Um, what what do you make of that? So I've seen the footage. Um, I cannot speak to what their intent was or what they were trying to accomplish, um, what their targets were. I don't know what they were. Obviously, we do not want to see entire villages destroyed. We don't want to see civilian homes destroyed. We don't want to see uh, civilian buildings destroyed. We understand that Hezbollah does operate at times from underneath civilian homes, inside civilian homes. We've seen footage that has emerged over the course of the past two weeks of rockets and other military uh, weapons held in civilian homes. So Israel does have a right to go after those legitimate targets, but they need to do so in a way that protects civilian infrastructure 
protects civilians. All right, I'm not sure I understand. What you, I, I cannot speak to the in, what their intent was or what they were. Been listening to the Matthew Miller, spokesperson for the State Department. Arguably, on day three of seeing an address there at that podium, three days in, you could rename that room to the pressure cooker. Pressure from the United States on Israel to increase humanitarian aid into Gaza. However, pressure from reporters who are saying, let's drill down, let's really get granular there and see how you'll do this. Because really the bargaining card for the United States is, look, we provide you military aid and assets. And a lot of people asking, will the United States pull some of the military assets if Israel does not make sure that not only the humanitarian aid gets there, but also a system is in place on the ground to make sure it gets to the people who are hungry, who are sick, who are wounded, and who are suffering because of this war there. So many more things to come and much more to come out of the Department of State. We wait and see if there will be more briefings in the days to come, but it looks like this story isn't going anywhere. Another story sticking around, Hurricane Helene and rescue and recovery efforts. Word that in, in Florida and in North Carolina, scores are missing. More on that when we come back. Turning our focus to the hurricane-ravaged areas of Florida and North Carolina. Tens of thousands still without electricity and in some parts of North Carolina, students still cannot return to the school with no timeline yet on when schools will reopen. CBS News national correspondent Janet Shamlian following the search for 92 who still remain missing. So we now have a number of the unaccounted for in North Carolina. We got that from Governor Roy Cooper, it is 92. That's a high number, and a lot of folks are facing the fact that they may never find their loved ones. We spoke to a young woman who lives in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Her name is Jessica Mittinger, and her mom, uh, Kim Ashby, is among the 92 missing. And she told us just a horrific story of how her mother and her stepfather were caught in the floodwaters, and her mother was washed away, and they have not recovered her body. and. It's very heartbreaking for this family because they need that for closure, and uh, just as these other families do. But what we're finding, and, and is that the the search teams are diminishing. Um, you know, resources are drying up. Uh, they're still on the ground. You know, we've seen that firsthand, and they range from volunteers to local to federal crews, but it's not what it was in the first days, now almost three weeks after Helene. And she just talked about the fact that, um, you know, they haven't even been able to tell Kim Ashby's uh, grandson yet. He's three years old. He would not understand this. Grandma was his favorite person. And um, just what these families are going through, which is just the uncertainty, the not knowing, wondering where their loved ones are, and, you know, hoping against hope at this point that they will have something to bury or to recover to put some closure to their lives. Back to you. Such a grim reality there in North Carolina. And mm -hmm. we remember that even after the weather event, the human story continues to play out. Let's talk Completely. about the weather story the rest of the week. Yeah, you know, as they are dealing with the recovery process, they're so resilient, by yeah. the way. I mean, all the stories coming out of North Carolina and Florida, too, after getting hit just last week with a Category 3 hurricane, those stories are impactful and you can help in so many different ways. So let's dive into the forecast for us because we still have six weeks left of hurricane season and we've been talking about that a lot today for a reason. The tropics are relatively calm thanks to some weather patterns that are suppressing all of that tropical activity just to the south. And don't get me wrong, the National Weather Service is still keeping a close eye on conditions as well as the National Hurricane Center. So let's take a look behind me at what they're seeing right now. We had that strong cold front and you know this if you live over in the northeast or even along the east coast show shoreline where winds and gusty conditions are still sticking around for us, but those cool temperatures are holding on tight too. a cold front pushed its way down past Florida just into the overnight hours last night and two days ago too. And now that's allowing for the tropics to, like I said, stay a little bit more suppressed, but there is still a system out there just close to Mexico where we have about 10% chance of formation with that one within the next 48 hours. If it were to develop and moves off into the east, not posing a threat for the states at least. Now we also see another system out there, the National Hurricane 
Center keeping a close eye on this one. A little bit better of a chance for it to form within the next two days. However, as it does that, we're going to see it turn into a tropical depression by the time it makes any landfall closer to Cuba, stretching all the way over into the Dominican Republic, too. So relatively calm conditions right now in the tropics, but we still have more weeks ahead of hurricane season. We'll keep a close eye on that here in the Weather Center. All right, thank you. We're also keeping a close eye through our monitors, a video coming out of the memorial service for the matriarch of the Kennedy family, Ethel Kennedy, eulogized very soon by uh, President Biden. We also understand that memorial service is being attended by other former presidents, Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. Right now, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi is speaking. When we come back, we'll let you listen. But nonetheless, I can enjoy her politics. We know that. And each year, until recently, as Joe... The sound of Nancy Pelosi, Speaker Emerita, speaking to mourners in Washington, D.C., a memorial service for Ethel Kennedy, the wife of former U.S. Senator Robert F. Kennedy. And you can see there to the left on your screen three former presidents, or two former presidents and one current president, of course, President Biden there, soon to be former president, then Barack Obama and Bill Clinton there among the mourners paying tribute to the life and the service of Ethel Kennedy there in our nation's capital. Video to our monitors take us to Texas in a landfill search for the body of a missing mother. Nobody has seen or heard from 51-year-old Suzanne Simpson since the night she disappeared on October 6th. So police arrested her husband, Brad Chandler, days later on two misdemeanor charges of assault. Reports suggest she was last seen fighting with her husband. We'll continue to watch this one closely. And another search, this time for a missing Broadway dancer in South Carolina, Zelig Williams' car found near a hiking trail, but no sign of Zelig. I'll fast forward to today, two weeks into the search. Here's his family asking for your help in that area just moments ago. Pay attention. Look at his face. All right, on the flyers, on the pictures. He might have facial hair. He might not. Please pay attention. Right before Zelig went missing, he stopped taking his medicine, is the belief, okay? And that would put him in a situation that he would be very, very vulnerable, all right? Because he might be appear to be in distress or maybe even in a trans-like state, okay? And it makes him very vulnerable. So we, we beg you to please pay attention and bring him home. Such a visceral reaction from that family member. William's credits include groundbreaking Hamilton and Michael Jackson, MJ the Musical. Video to our monitors out of Turkey takes us inside a home at the moment an earthquake hit. Watch this closely. See the fish tank there shaking? Uh, that water there shook because of a 5.9 magnitude quake striking the eastern part of that country. Things stayed on the shelves, though. But watch the fishes. They're the testimony that that place did shake just a little bit. The moment also caught a live television scene. This is the scene inside of a newsroom. And look, this is what they tell us to do when an earthquake hits, because we got lights over our heads. People that anchor, taking cover, getting under the desk. Heard saying a prayer as the studio started to tremble. No reports of major damage or death, according to officials there. Just a reminder, earthquakes happen and be prepared. We are not even to November yet, but it's never too early to start thinking about the holidays. One crew in New York City has a leg up, so to speak, on holiday preparations, and there they are. The Radio City Rockettes hard at work ahead of the Christmas Spectacular. Probably the most famous kick line in all of the world, and a delight to fans every time. Rockettes say they rehearse for six hours, six days a week. That's it for us at CBS News 24-7. Thank you for watching more coverage of urgent issues all around the globe. We appreciate you watching.